Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Sydney Finkelstein. Sydney is a professor at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College. Additionally, Sydney is a consultant and speaker to senior executives around the globe as well as an executive coach, focusing on leadership, talent development, corporate governance, learning from mistakes, and strategies for growth. He is a fellow of the Academy of Management and listed on the Thinkers 50, the world's most prestigious ranking of leadership gurus. He has been featured in the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Harvard Business Review, Business Week, the London Times, Toronto Globe, and Mail, Inc., Fast Company, and CNBC. He is also a columnist for the BBC and the host of his own podcast, The Sidcast. Sydney, thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. Thanks, Megan. Great to be on with you. Yeah, you are a professor at Tuck School at Dartmouth, author of Super Bosses, and podcast host of The Sidcast. And I'm honored to have you on my show today. Uh, We're going to be hearing your story and looking at the role of a leader, the qualities great leaders possess, and how they go about creating future great leaders. As I said, I've been really looking forward to this conversation. So let's get started with you. First of all, can you tell us a a little bit about your career journey and how it is you got to where you are today? Well, Megan, how many hours do you have for this part? Uh, (laughs) I'll, I'll keep it. I'll keep it short. I grew up in Canada, in Montreal, and uh, early uh, um, after I went to college and graduate school, and um, had a chance to actually be a teacher and instructor at the university I went to in Montreal, uh, which is called Concordia University, uh, which is a great a great school, not that well known globally, but very very good school. And um, I was 23 years old, and they wanted me to teach. I didn't. Uh, I had a master's degree at that point. And I thought, well, why not? That sounds like fun. And I was scrambling to figure out how to do all that because, of course, I didn't have very much experience. I hadn't really worked with very many organizations, very many companies by then, but I did it. And I had a two-year contract and I did really, really well. And what happened is my boss, who is the um, who was at that time the head of the department, the management and uh, the management department, um, and I now call him a super boss, by the way. Uh, he basically fired me. Um, he, he told me, you know, you're doing well, that you're doing great. You know, the students really like you. But if you want to be serious about this career, you need to go get a PhD. You need to go work with companies more. You need to really kind of get immersed into the field. Um, and I wasn't happy to hear that uh, because I was having a great old time. But um, Sometimes, you know, uh, you, you, when you let, let somebody go who has a lot of potential, it opens a door to their, to their opportunities. And that's what he did for, for me. And I ended up going to Columbia for my PhD. I used to teach early on at University of Southern California, now at the Tuck School at Dartmouth College for almost three decades. And I do a lot of work on leadership and strategy and work with, have worked with companies around the world. Um, and basically tried to do all those things that that uh, former department uh, chair said I needed to do and and then some. And uh, luckily, it's all worked out. Yeah, it sounds like it has. And sometimes we need that that kick in the pants, I guess. Um, Get us out of our comfort zone and, and, you know, a change is scary, but good. Yeah, comfort zone is a funny thing, isn't it? Um, Yeah, it really is. We we like it uh, (laughs) because it's comfortable. But uh, I have spent my uh, I've spent my career trying to fight against that natural tendency to kind of just get comfortable with anything. Uh, and you can't always you don't always do it. And sometimes you don't have to always do it because you have to be able to you know, enjoy, uh, you know, where, where you know, your, your present circumstance, wherever it is. But I've always found the best learning comes from challenging and pushing and questioning. And um, and it's certainly what I've advocated. Um, throughout my career for my students and for consulting clients and people that I coach, um, as well as one of the themes of what makes for great, great leaders. So uh, it's a big point you're bringing up. 
So as you look back on your career, and maybe you've touched on them a bit already, but are there any stories that stand out in your mind as turning points? Well, certainly being fired, that qualifies. But yeah. I'll tell you one even, uh, even earlier, uh, which is uh, uh, really interesting when I reflect on it. Um, I once thought I would be an accountant, which uh, might sound a little bit strange for a guy that does a lot of work on leadership. But um, my older brother, Simon, was an accountant and I looked up to him. And so I decided, well, why don't I do that? And, uh, and I, in my first job doing that, I uh, I was doing some, you know, entry level accounting is auditing type work. I hadn't gotten my my C uh, CPA it was called the CA in Canada um, yet. Uh, and um, I had my review with my manager and the manager, you know, said a lot of great things about, you know, that it was very analytical and uh, definitely diligent, focused and getting, you know, getting the job done, getting it done quickly. But then he said, you know, if there's one thing you really want to work on, it's one thing you want to, you want to, you want to change. Uh, of course, I leaned in to hear what that was because I wanted to get better. He said, "You really should stop asking so many questions." <laughs> and that Funny was advice. my that was my last day in accounting, which I'm kind of proud of because I was young, and what did I know? Uh, but somehow I had that intuition uh, that asking questions not only. Um, not only is it not a, not a bad thing, it's an incredibly important thing. And, and I've found that the best leaders ask the best questions because, you know, you can come up with a great, uh, you, you could spend forever trying to solve a problem or a strategy or direction or a project. But if it starts off with a question that's fundamentally faulty or not creative enough or not out there enough, then you've kind of been spinning your wheels. And, um, and so asking questions is, 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 is not just important, it's central. And of course, you know, kind of how I ended up kind of making my career, that's my job as a, as a professor, you ask questions and then you go try to solve or answer those questions. And that's called research. And um, so that was, a, that was a pretty powerful lesson early on um, and one that um, was a real eye opener for me. Yeah, I mean, questions, is the key to learning. And once you stop learning, um, life's pretty much over. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I would like to think that the profession of accounting has evolved over the years. You know what? I, of course it has. Um, I, uh, and maybe, you know, I was one of these kids that just, I always, I always wanted to know more and maybe I was starting to get annoying. <laughs> it's certainly <laughs> possible. It's certainly possible. Uh, Sounds like my very, son. <laughs> it's very odd advice in any event. Um, uh, but I thank him for it because if he couched it a little bit softer, or some, maybe I would have been there in, uh, a bit a bit longer. Yeah, you would have missed your calling. Who well, who knows? So what courses do you teach as a professor at Dartmouth? So I used to teach the core business strategy course for many years. Now, over the last, um, and I used to teach a course on mergers and acquisitions as well. Um, but over the last 10 years, my primary courses are one that I call strategic leadership which is kind of, you know, like a SID course. It's my stuff. It's the thing I, things I do research on, the things I work on with companies. Uh, and I just kind of created a course all, all around it. So it has to do with developing talent, how to be a great leader, um, how to hire and select talent, how to build, uh, how to build great teams, how to manage uh, unexpected challenges as a leader. Um, and then the other course that I spend, that I teach now, um, primary course, is uh, actually a two-week intensive program for all of our uh, incoming uh, MBA students. They all take this course and I teach, I lead this and I teach in it, but I have their other faculty that I brought in to teach other portions of it. And it's kind of like a, um, a boot camp and an orientation at the same time uh, to, uh, to the two-year MBA program. And, um, um, and I've created all kinds of interesting experiential exercises uh, as part of that to get uh, to really send the signal that, you know, this is not school as normal. This is, this is going to change you. This is going to challenge you. Talk about comfort zone. And, and this has potential to transform who you are as an individual. And I want to start to send that. You can't do that in two weeks, but I want to start sending that signal through a variety of different things that, uh, that we, we do in that, in, that, uh, in that program. So those are the primary things I teach now. Yeah, that boot camp sounds like an amazing experience. 
Um, of course, we can't all get into Dartmouth, but um, as we were talking about be before we started recording, you've recently released courses on Coursera. So can you tell us a little bit of, about those? Yeah, this has been such a, a fun thing. You know, uh, there's so many online courses that are that are out there. It's exploded as a uh, as an area. Uh, and I uh, I resisted it for a while. But now that we created this por this partnership with Coursera, which really is a best in class, you know, global firm, they have 100 million learners, which is a crazy number. And um, and so I had a chance to put together four courses. Uh, they call a, a group or a set of four courses a specialization for which they, if you pass them and do them, you can get a certificate. Um, and, and these four courses are based, three of the four courses are based on books and areas of work that I've spent literally decades uh, working on. So it's kind of like my, my life's work uh, in here. And then the fourth course is brand new things that I haven't even written about yet. Uh, about personal leadership and, and things that I'm thinking about that I'm thinking about now. So, um, and the courses consist of, you know, a series of, of uh, videos that I created from scratch, as well as something like uh, 50 uh, application exercises, which is my way of saying, you know, uh, if you want to use the ideas that I'm sharing with you and the thoughts and the techniques and the methods and all that, if you want to use it, you need to know how to use it. You need to apply it. It's not enough just to be able to regurgitate it back. I don't, I'm not a believer in, you know, these quizzes that, that sometimes you see in online courses, you know, the multiple choice questions that tells you nothing for a topic like, like mine, which is, you know, about leadership, strategic thinking, making better decisions, living a better life even. And, um, and so applying it uh, to yourself and to the people around you is where the action is. And so I created those as well. So uh, it's just launched. There are already thousands of people that have started uh, these courses. So it's very, very exciting to see where it's going. And, and you know, your listeners can find it uh, uh, just by Googling my name and Coursera and the specialization is called Strategic Leadership. Awesome. I'm definitely going to look into it. You also have a podcast, which is called The Sidcast. So what's this podcast about in general? Yeah, this one, uh, I'm, uh, I'm into my fourth season now, and it's just been so much fun. It's, it's a, uh, I call it um, informative and informal conversations with really fascinating people and often people that um, uh, may not be as well known as some of the, uh, uh, you know, some of the famous people that are out there. I, I feel like, and I feel like I know everyone has a story, has an interesting story to tell. And I help that, that person tell their, their life story. And so we talk about their career, we talk about lessons learned along the way. We talk about their their life, sometimes their personal life, certainly growing up. Um, and I have people that are, you know, entrepreneurs. I have some academics in different fields that are doing fascinating research, you know, from, from people that are, you know, graphic designers working, uh, working on Pixar films to, um, uh, to one, um, one professor, one academic uh, who uh, is working with NASA and sending a... Uh, uh, an orbiter to to land on one of the moons of Jupiter, kind of un unbelievable, you know, topics. And I have some sports people, both athletes and uh, presidents uh, of teams, um, entertainers, um, and of course uh, some good old fashioned uh, leaders and CEOs. So uh, really diverse types of people, great conversations, and um, um, a chance a chance for me to help somebody bring their story to a wide audience, um, chock full of lessons and just an interesting, interesting conversation as well. Uh, and as you look back on the last four years, you have uh, an episode that stands out in your mind as maybe one of the more memorable or, or even your favorite. Wow. There's a, there's a lot. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share one that is, it's the most downloaded of all the episodes. So I guess the, uh, the audience or the marketplace has spoken on that one too, um, and it's a it's a very powerful episode with a young woman named Kate Spear S P E E R. Uh, it's a woman that um, she sp she talks openly about her struggle with um, with mental illness for a very very long time, and and uh, and and misdiagnoses and having to really um, really struggle. Um, but she, over time, started to 
figured it out, started to get better, started to get the right type of treatment and found, this is kind of amazing, found that her dog, her pet, uh, could almost predict when she was going to have a, uh, what she calls a psychotic episode where she gets these, these uh, hallucinations that are, um, that are damaging. And the pet, uh, the dog, warns her ahead of time that it's happening and comforts her before it even hits her. And so she knows something's about to happen in her brain that is not real. And it helps her, it's hel- and it helped her deal with it. And lo and behold, as she got better and started talking openly about this, she started to help so many young people that have these, these um, you know, when you're, you're in middle school, high school, early years, it's, uh, it's challenging uh, anyways. And then you have, you have episodes that you just don't know how to deal with or not sure what to do with. And she is today the CEO of a company called The Doggist, which is so appropriate, <laughs> D-O-G-G-I-S-T. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but it started as an Instagram account by an out-of-work photographer in New York City that would take photos of dogs and add some captions. And they, are, they have now become a real business and she is helping them run and monetize the idea. And they have books and other activities as well. So it's a, uh, it's a powerful story, a powerful journey that she shares bravely and openly and, uh, and a very happy story as well uh, as, it's turned, as it's turned out. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a very brave story. Yeah, yeah. Um, so last month, you focused on leading through times of crisis and change. What's, what's your advice for this? Leading through crisis, <laughs> well, um, I've always been a believer in as hard as it as hard as it may be, facing up to the reality of the world around us. Just kind of being willing somehow to say, "Okay, this is not good. This is scary, but this is the way it is." I call that intellectual honesty. You know, it's being honest with yourself about the way the world is, yeah. whether that's you know, COVID and the challenges that have happened, whether that's people being in, in jobs that are not fulfilling uh, or that they're looking to change, whether it's people dealing with personal um, um, life uh, issues about their personal life, whether it's people uh, in a more, in, you know, in a more strategic sense, kind of looking at their business and saying, you know, it's not working the way I thought it was going to work and I need to do something about this. And so, you, you know, you have to be kind of, you have to be strong to do this. And the way that I described, you know, Kate Spear just a moment ago, uh, the woman from the dog is having to eventually, and it took, it took a while, but recognize that this is her life. This is who she is. These are the challenges she has to face. Now let's figure out how to, how to do it. Uh, and I think that's my number one, um, my number one bit of advice. And it's a hard, it's a hard advice. It's not that easy to take because, you know, we, all of us would like to sometimes pretend that uh, what we're dealing with is not real. Um, and, and I understand that, but sticking our head in the sand and ignoring change, ignoring, um, crisis, ignoring challenges doesn't mean it goes away. And, um, and, and, and so step one is got to be, um, not acceptance that life is like, like, like this, but recognition or awareness that yes, this is my challenge. Now let's figure out what to do about it. Yeah. The, the word authentic came to mind as, as you were describing that. Um, yes, it's well, hard. absolutely. Yeah. It's a quality. It's hard. It's not easy. Yeah. It's hard to be yourself and to be authentic. Yeah, it, 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 it is. That's a word that's used a lot also, you know, authentic. And um, sometimes being authentic can get you in trouble. That's the bad part about it. Not everyone is open, is open-minded. But I, I really believe that especially in the modern economy that exists today, there are so many careers, so many uh, um, career tracks and so many things changing that we owe it to ourselves. Every one of your listeners owes it to herself or himself to, to find the, the, the spot, the job, the situation that they find fulfilling. Work doesn't have to be just, you know, work. Um, and I know maybe, you know, not everyone's going to be able to get there. And some jobs are just, you know, tough jobs. But I, I, I think we should try. Uh, and, and I could tell you also what those jobs look like, by the way. There's all, there are several characteristics that you, you want to look for or you want to try to create. You, you want to create um, 
or look for as much autonomy as possible. This is one of the reasons why this work from home world we're in now and hybrid has has become such a big topic and it's not going away. It's not that COVID has gone away, but most people are learning to live with, uh, with live in a world where there will be some COVID. Uh, just like there's some flu and other, and other things like that. But, uh, but it continues this issue about working from home. A lot of CEOs I talk to are still struggling with this. And, and the reason it's so central is because I think the underlying issue here is autonomy. People yeah. want to feel autonomy. They want to feel like they have some control over their over their their work, over their lives. And when they do, they are going to be happier and more fulfilled in that job. And that's what you want to you want to look for. I would say number one, autonomy. Number two, impact a job where you can actually do something good for someone, something, uh, some aspect of society. I always say to leaders, to managers, you need to convey to the people in your team and the people around you that in f- that um, that this work means something that it counts. And the question I I always uh, I always ask is, uh, you need to answer this question: Why do we exist? Why do you exist as a team or as a business? And there's got to be a really good answer. And if the answer is to make a lot of money. It's not a good enough answer. I'm a capitalist and I like a lot of money too, but that's not a good, that's not where meaning comes from. So autonomy, impact, and I'd say connection, uh, a job that allows you to connect with other people in some way. People need people. We certainly have seen that in our two years plus of, of COVID with so much isolation and, and the problems that it created and, uh, and being able to uh, work with uh, either directly or indirectly people that you feel some degree of connection to, uh, that you get some value from, uh, adds, adds a lot. So those are, those are the characteristics of great jobs, and that's what we should be looking for. I don't think people should settle for anything other than that, other than that whenever, ever possible. Yeah, that's, the, that's great advice. Um, and, you, and you brought up connection. How, how can companies create connection in a world that's mostly remote any well, advice for that yeah there there are a few things you can you can do i mean i'll give you a couple of very very simple practical tips so when people are working remotely i think looking forward most people will have some degree of hybrid even if you're working mostly remotely there will be occasions where you be where you will be face to face in fact my daughter started a new job in uh, November of uh, 2021. And she met her boss for the first time five months later, face to face. And uh, it's not unusual. She's a millennial. It's, uh, you know, this, this happens. But how did they spend their time together? There were no long presentations and PowerPoint slides and formalities they were face to face. They were talking. They uh, they they had dinner together with some other colleagues to talk informally. We have to use our face to face time much better than we typically or historically have because it's so rare. And that's my that's my first tip. Yeah. Uh, don't fill up that time with uh, with with PowerPoint slides and all the other stuff and and meeting after meeting that uh, that could wait for other other circumstances. And then I think the the second the second uh, tip, and this gets to connection that's not just about accomplishing your goals, although it has a lot to do with it, but but kind of living your you know, living your life and building that connection uh, is we've got to schedule some one on one time with people um, where they could uh, where you could learn from your boss, you could learn um, you could you could learn, I think so much teaching, so much um, development of individuals on the job comes from that kind of one-on-one uh, experience. And, and yes, you could even do it on Zoom if you, uh, if you needed to, uh, if it's one-on-one, but you could also do it outdoors and for, you know, to the extent that we have another, uh, you know, another flare up or people have different cons- personal concerns about, um, about COVID, which are understandable, you know, walk and talk. I've had tons of meetings that are walk and talk. Um, uh, one-on-one and they're fun. Uh, you get a little bit of exercise and, uh, and you get to know somebody at a different, a different level. Um, and so we got to use our time well, and we have to look for more creative ways to spend time one-on-one to build that connection. And also at the same time, advance our careers and advance our learning. You know, a lot of my students are worried about 
developing graduating students are, de- are worried about developing mentors and, and, and developing those strong professional interpersonal relationships that are so critical to getting anything done. And, and they're right. If you're hundred percent on zoom, it's going to be, it's going to be tough to, to do that. So we got to be smart. We got to be, uh, we got to protect our time and use it well. And we have to be creative as well. And you're also the author of the bestseller, Super Bosses, How Exceptional Leaders Master the Flow of Talent. So first, let's start with the idea of a super boss. What exactly is that? Yeah, so super boss is a leader that sees the potential in other leaders, often before they see it themselves. It's a leader that uh, generates and regenerates talent really on a continual basis. It's someone that is great at scouting for talent, uh, for looking for talent, for identifying talent, uh, developing people, motivating and developing people, building strong teams as well. And, and so it's not just a good leader or a good manager. Of course, they are that. But they, they have elevated the importance of talent um, to a level that um, stands out. And working for a super boss leader is one of the absolute best ways to accelerate your career as well, because they, they'll, they'll help you get better. They won't always make it easy. Uh, you know, sometimes people make the mistake of assuming that they want a nice boss. Well, a nice boss is not necessarily a good boss. I'll take nice over nasty. I got that. But a, nice, but a good boss is someone that will push you, that will challenge you, will take you out of your comfort zone, as we talked about at the beginning of our conversation. That's what, that's what the best bosses will do. And super boss leaders will do that. And so working for somebody like that uh, is one of, the, one of the best ways to advance, to accelerate your career. And let's talk about how they do that. So how do they go about motivating, inspiring, and in enabling others? Yeah. So um, when it comes to motivation, they do two things that, in my experience, um, should go together, but don't often go together. One is that they do create a strong performance-driven culture. They push people hard. Um, the expectations are there for, for getting the job done, getting it done at a high, high level. But they do this second thing as well when it comes to motivation, and that's that inspiration word that you reference. They inspire people uh, to believe that they're the ones um, that could do it. You know, Ralph Lauren is one of my super boss leaders that I profile in the book, and he used to say to his, to his team and to people in the company, we are the ones that set the standard. We don't copy other people. They might try to copy what we're doing, but we will not do that. We will always be a step ahead. And he believed it. He was, again, to use a word you brought up earlier, he was authentic. He was genuine about that. And he, he inspired people to believe there's nothing they can't do. So what I learned from the super boss leaders is these two sides, the yin and the yang of motivation, if you will. Challenging people, pushing people hard, creating that performance-driven expectation and at the same time inspiring them to, to actually actually do it and to believe that, that they can do it. And, and I've seen managers that are good with, good with one or the other, but you really need to be able to do, to do both. Motivating, of course, is not the whole story. It's, it's kind of how you, get the, the, um, how, you, how you get the train in motion. The other thing I'll, I'll, I'll say that they do, which is kind of like the day-to-day development of talent. Earlier when I referenced how important it is for people to uh, have some time working one-on-one with their boss, that that's where people really learn. That is, uh, that is a super boss idea. And, and that one-on-one time will involve teaching. Um, they'll teach people on their team uh, about, about the business, about sometimes about life, sometimes about how to, how to, uh, uh, how to manage other people. It will, um, you know, a good way to summarize it is that they've actually resurrected the most common method of develop, of developing talent in the history of, I don't know if the world, but, uh, let's say for hundreds of years. So that's quite a, quite a statement. And that is, um, the, the master apprentice relationship. Uh, they have resurrected a master apprentice relationship so that when you work for a super boss, it's almost like you're, you are an apprentice to, to that master and they are teaching you their craft. They're teaching you all about, all about that business. And, uh, uh, and they don't only teach you, but they do two other things that are important. One, they create opportunities for people. Uh, how, how many, 
how many of us have had these great opportunities that uh, a boss saw something, a leader saw something in us and was willing to take a chance? And we were probably, you know, many of these examples, many of these instances, we're probably afraid or concerned. And uh, that's that comfort zone thing coming up yet again. But, um, but we did it and we looked back and we said, wow, there's nothing I can't do now. And it just kind of, it just accelerates your career. And then the, and then the other aspect of developing talent that's part of this master apprentice kind of mindset is that uh, these leaders customize how they work with each person on their team. They spend the time to know who they are, to know how they think, what they like, how they behave. And then they, and then they customize their, their, their actions and their behaviors, which is, if you think about it, a really big deal because we live in a world today that has customization of everything, you know, type in a search term on Google and it completes the term for you. Um, It knows what you're thinking even before you've written it down. It's kind of spooky. But when it comes to developing talent, where is that customization? We seem to, we seem to fall into this, uh, this, this trap of saying, and and I bet a lot of people can relate to this. You have a new boss. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to talk to colleagues and say, okay, what's she like? Uh, uh, what, what's this going to be like? How, what are we going to have to deal with now? We think about how we adapt, uh, how we need to adapt ourselves to our boss, when in fact, the super boss leader understands that it should be quite the opposite, that they need to adapt or to customize how they work with each person in their team. And, uh, and they do that. And the loyalty that they generate is tremendous. Um, the ability to get more out of people and for people to feel, again, meaning, uh, uh, um, fulfilled and engaged in their work goes up. So those are some of the main things that we learned the super boss leaders do. Yeah, I mean, in this day and age when talent is so scarce, it seems like becoming a super boss, uh, you know, would, would elevate the company in general. But yeah. do you think people are born super bosses? Are they raised to be super bosses? Or is this something that we can become later in life as an adult yeah so first a quick point on the on the premise of your question which is exactly right in in our modern era the talent uh what what do we call the great resignation yeah Uh, has there ever been a more important first of all has there ever been a better time to have talent at anything the opportunities are incredible but has there ever been a, a a more important time for leaders to up their game and figure out how to really be a, a great leader? Um, because that is what now, that is now expected. That is required. It's not, uh, it's not an option anymore. And a great leader helps other people get better. They advance their careers to the point of being, you know, are you born or can you do this? I, uh, not only do I believe that you can do this, that you could learn how to do this, I, I, I know you could for, for a bunch of reasons, one, one of which is I've been doing that with teams and organizations and leaders now for several years, and, and you could see the result. But uh, just in a kind of anecdotal way, I could tell you that uh, before COVID, uh, I was on the road a lot, d- doing a lot of different work, including book signings. And you know people come up to me and I'd like you to sign your book to my boss. Now that I heard you speak, I know my boss is a super boss. And so I signed the name to that person. I never heard of that person uh, in almost every instance. I, I, I often didn't even hear about the company. In other words, there are super boss leaders up and down every company, every organization that's there. They're not enough, but they're, but they're not that scarce. They're, they are there. We need to recognize them more. We need to value them more, I think. But they're there. And that's an indication that, in fact, um, a lot of people have begun to figure out how to do, how to do this. Every every one of the um, I call it the Super Boss Playbook, a whole series of in fact this the, the books that I've written about Super Bosses. The first one is called Super Bosses, and then the follow up two or three years later is called the Super Boss Playbook that has these tools and techniques and and practices to help people become super bosses exactly to kind of address the question that you've raised, but you know, can you learn how to do that? And in fact, you, you can, and every single aspect of what super bosses do uh, are there. They are learnable. They're teachable and they're learnable. You have to want to do it and you have to work at it, uh, but they're absolutely learnable. Well, that's good to know. Um, so we've talked a lot about success, but you've also spent a lot of time studying why executives fail. So, mm-hmm. 
What do you think is the biggest reason that, that this happens? Well, that's uh, that's quite a big question. Um, I wrote a book called Why Smart Executives Fail and did a lot of follow-up work uh, on that on that topic. And there are, there are a lot of reasons, but if I were to if I were to kind of drill down into the single biggest reason, it is that sometimes people, meaning meaning leaders, um, forget that some of the some of the flaws that all of us have as individuals. Um, and they could be biases in how we think. They could be believing we know more than we do. They could be arrogance and complacency. They could be uh, believing our experience is even more powerful, and more relevant than it actually is because the world has changed around us, around us. It could be because we procrastinate. It could be because we sometimes stick our head in the sand. All of those very human um, defects, if you will, uh, problems, uh, biases. When we allow those things to take hold as a leader, that's when failure happens. And that's what makes it tough because they're very, they're very natural. There are times in all of our lives when we probably have fallen into some of these traps. And so being alert to them, being self-aware, surrounding yourself with people that uh, are unafraid to speak up and to uh, feel that psychological safety to uh, um, to share their point of view, even if it dis- even if it's a different point of view than the one that you might have as a as a leader. These are the things that are uh, these are the things that are needed, and um, um, and so the irony is that the number one reason why what I call smart executives, managers, executives, leaders that have previously been successful or have had some degree of success, the number one reason why they derail, why they fail is that is is because they allow those those very human um, traits that all of us occasionally have to take hold, to take control of them and not to fight back and and uh, and and then fall into these um, fall into these traps of believing we know more than we do and, uh, and not listening and and arrogance and complacency and um, uh, and even to circle back to one of the first things we talked about, not willing to put ourselves out of our comfort zone to try something new to change to adapt. Uh, because we we're just so comfortable with where we've been, and uh, and we're afraid that something might go wrong. Yeah, I mean, we're all born with biases, and it, it's amazing to me just how many there are <laughs> and how strong they are. That's part of human nature, but we need to know that we need to be alert to that, and we need to uh, we need to be self aware. And you know what? We also need to do some of those things that are kind of softy things. But you know, I use the word reflection. Uh, reflection is just thinking, taking a few minutes every day. You don't have to take a lot, to a lot, a lot of time to reflect and think about, and sometimes even write down some of those things that happened to us uh, during the day, and why, and 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 reflect about why we did things the way we did, and you know why why that's the case, and learn more about ourselves. People do this, by the way, in lots of ways. It's not just sitting down for ten minutes every day and reflecting. You can do it when you're jogging. You could do it in the shower. You know, when you just let your mind go. You could do it through meditation and yoga. There are a lot of ways to do it, but we need to, we need to do it and we need to try to capture that and do it in a purposeful way. And what do you believe is the most necessary skill set today for an executive to possess to, to succeed in the world of business? I would say the most important, the most important thing to succeed is to be unafraid of failing. And that's not easy as we, as we know. Imagine what you could do if you were not afraid to fail. It would be spectacular. And it's that, uh, it's that fear, it's that concern. But again, it's, it's a natural thing. For, so for some people, it takes the form of imposter syndrome. For other people, you know, on my podcast, uh, not that long ago, I was talking to a CEO of a company who, who said, I, when I asked him, you know, what do you wish you'd done differently? And he said, I wish I wasn't so afraid. And he was successful. I wish I wasn't so afraid of making a mistake. Uh, it slowed me down, um, and it took me a long time to get to get to where I ended up. And it didn't have to be that way. So that's what I would say. Yeah, that's Stop great being advice. So afraid. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I I look at my life, and I know I'm I'm still afraid of things, and and it it holds people back. It does, and it's again, like I said earlier, it's a very human thing. But we we need to we need to be alert to it. We need to know what it is, and we need to set ourselves up so that we don't let it dominate. And Sydney, lastly, 
As an expert on leadership and talent, what obstacles do you try to foresee for your students that are just starting out? And what's on the horizon? And, and what do you think is holding people back? Well, you know, all these questions you've been asking are great questions. And I feel like I, I can pontificate for a very, very long time because there's a lot of aspects to these, uh, to these, great, uh, these great questions. Um, what keeps me up at night is thinking about uh, how I can continue to have an impact on the communities I, I care about, which in my case, it's different for everyone. In my case, it would be my students, it would be executives that I work with and coach. It would be my family and friends. Um, how can I keep getting better? How can I get continue to push myself to get out of my comfort zone so that I could do what I uh, what I've set what I've set out to try to do in my uh, uh, not just my career but my my life and and I and I would say that you can translate that idea uh, in a much broader way to 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 be the challenge for every one of us in whatever career track we're in whatever whatever work we happen to do we're always about impact if we don't feel like we're having an impact on the world or our friends or our family in some way we will be less happy. It is simply the way it is, and we will have less meaningful lives and careers. And I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want that to happen to anyone. And so that's what I advocate. That's what I want people to think about. Um, and, and it's not a one and done. It is pretty much a continuous process of challenge, of questioning, and you know what? Of even creativity and courage as well. Sydney, thank you so much for being my guest today. I feel like I could literally talk to you all day. Megan, I really appreciate the time and the opportunity. And I, uh, it's, been, it's been great to engage with you on these really, really important questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. And I wish you all the best. And to all of our listeners, take care. And until next week, when we're back again, I wish you all the best. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personif. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personif can do for you by visiting personif.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personif. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personif.com. Thanks for listening.